Welcome to the Pacific Research Institute's Next Round Podcast. I'm Rowena Itchon, Senior Vice President, and with me, as always, is Tim Anaya, Senior Director of Communications. So we're taping this podcast the Monday before Election Day. Uh, we're going to avoid talking about the election and sounding dated, but listeners should rest assured that we're going to have a lot to say next week. And in fact, we've lined up PRI Chairman Clark Judge, who is a longtime political observer and runs a White House Writers Group in D.C., and he's one of our most popular guest, so I'm sure he's going to have a, a lot of insight next week. So Tim, there's, there's a lot of hoopla about the Republicans likely taking over the House and possibly the Senate, but frankly, the president still has veto power, so I don't think that voters can expect a sea change that, that they're hoping for. That's right. I mean, we've seen this before when we ha- have had divided government. Yes, there are some things around the edges that maybe everybody could agree on, but it just turns into, uh, you know, we're past a bill to force the president to veto it or the president demands some bill be brought up and Congress ignores him. You know, I, I and I think that's I, I would expect nothing less. The interesting thing will be in this lame duck period, you know, in November and December before the new Congress takes office, will Biden and the Democrats basically try to push in every big thing over the, that's needed over the next two years in that period? You know, will they try to pass things like have the debt ceiling go through 2024, funding for Ukraine go through to a very long period? Uh, and will Democrats who lost their seat be up for going along with that. So that will be interesting to see. But certainly if he tries to push some of those issues into the new Congress, they're going to be very wary of giving Biden that kind of a blank check. I agree. And of course, the GOP will propose their own legislation that President Biden is likely to veto. So the GOP will, will be able to run on you know their proposals and their, and their platform for the presidential election. So no matter what, I think there's going to be a lot of politicking going on on in the next couple of years. A lot of hearings too, you know, you you can expect one thing Congress, you know, when Congress is controlled by the other party, you're going to have a lot of hearings. Some of them might be kind of painful, like you're going to know everything that Hunter Biden has ever done in his life, I predict. But you might have some useful hearings too, oversight hearings on, um, you know, what did we actually do during COVID? Have we spent that money properly? Where did COVID come from? You know, those are things that have been kind of swept under the rug from a from an oversight perspective. There's a lot of issues on energy where oversight is badly needed. So that's a, a place where even though they're not passing bills, Congress can provide a very useful function that's really lacking now in one party government. And I'd also like them to look at the politicization of the, the FBI and the Justice Department. I think there's something important to look into there. And then, of course, there's a, you know, the Senate has a power of, uh, advice and consent. And if the Republicans do take over the the Senate, um, they'll likely hold the line on a lot of these extreme politically left appointments from the administration. So so that's a positive. And to, um, you know, there's also a lot of issues with education. You know, we haven't really had any oversight of all of these COVID mandates on um, the impact of our children and their, and, you know, all of the learning loss with that. You know, certainly a lot, of, we've covered it. Um, you know, that our Lance Azumi has written extensively on that, but also a lot of the questionable COVID spending. Why did people get loans when they theoretically shouldn't have been eligible for them? Um, you know, there are a lot of issues like that where oversight really could inform the American people and inspire better policymaking going forward. So, Tim, you're also following this intrigue that's happening with a speaker in Sacramento. That's right. You know, you certainly are going to have in Congress the kind of elections for who are the Democrats going to have as their new leaders and who are the Republicans going to have as their new leaders. And there'll be a lot of intrigue on that, depending on what happens in the election. Well, you're for sure going to have that in Sacramento because we've had this simmering, I don't know if it's a Cold War or what is the the proper uh, way to describe it, um, feud, if you will, a rivalry between incumbent Speaker Anthony Rendon and Robert Rivas. Now, our listeners will remember back um, in summertime, Robert Rivas came out and said, I have the votes to be elected the next speaker. Well, it is uh, apparent that 
he may have had a majority of the vote inside the current Democratic caucus, but he didn't have 41 votes on the floor to get elected speaker. And that's the key thing. The speaker is elected by the whole house and you need to be able to count to 41. Well, so we've had this kind of simmering few. They kind of made nice for the cameras and sent out a joint statement that they'll be meeting together and all of that. But it's been kind of simmering. Well, during election season, you've seen Mr. Revis. He has formed a pact to help Assembly Democrats. Well, he's been spending a lot of his money on Democrats who are for sure going to win. And the rumbling is, well, he's not spending that money on Democrats where they might pick up seats and beat Republicans and have gains. So, of course, all of that spending is we want to get your vote for speaker when the time comes. So how it works, um, the election is Tuesday the 8th. Two days later on the 10th, Democrats and Republicans come to Sacramento and they meet in their separate party meetings. And that is traditionally when the party leadership is elected. So the Republican leader will be elected for the coming term. It'll probably be James Gallagher would be reelected. And then the Democratic leader will be elected. And that would be the person and who would be the next speaker. So this is coming to a head. Maybe by the time you listen to this, you'll know who the next speaker will be. And so we'll really see who does have the majority of votes inside the Democratic caucus. But that doesn't end it there, because if that person who has the most votes doesn't have 41 votes, Republican votes may be up in the air. Because remember, on swearing in day in December, it's the first Monday in December, the whole House will elect the new speaker. This is how Willie Brown became speaker back in 1980. There was a bitter speakership fight, and Willie Brown did a deal with the Republicans and got 41 votes. Will Robert Rivas, if he comes up short in the Democratic meeting, do a deal with Republicans and get 41 votes, or vice versa? Would Mr. Rendon get 41 votes? So there's a lot of intrigue to come, but the most intrigue vote will be who has the most votes after the Democratic caucus meeting this week. Right, Tim. So a lot of the election, unfortunately, won't be resolved after Tuesday. We'll be talking about this for, for weeks to come. So let's move on. A, a few housekeeping details. We've got a couple of speakers lined up for December. Seating is limited. So if you're interested, uh, please sign up if you haven't already. On Thursday, December 1st, we're, we're holding a luncheon in Newport Beach. Our speaker is Steve Hilton, host of Fox News is the, the Next Revolution. And so Steve is also a resident of California, and he's got a great podcast on California. So he'll be discussing some of the issues the state is facing. Also, many of you know that, that Steve follows UK politics. Politics. He had been a, a top advisor to former Prime Minister David Cameron, so we can ask him also about the, the new government um, in the UK. At the, the following week, December 6th, our guest is Professor Chiron Skinner of Pepperdine University. Listeners know that, that she was a foreign policy advisor to President Trump and a superb scholar. So Dr. Skinner uh, was a recipient of, a, of our Sir Anthony Fisher Freedom Prize. And, and you know, Tim, she only had about 10 minutes to, to give a speech, but it was an incredible 10 minutes. So we decided to have her back for a longer discussion. Well, they they uh, undoubtedly will be terrific events. And get your tickets now because, you know, the these uh, luncheons and receptions that we put on that are our great events. Director Laura Dannerbeck is, is in charge of. They're always terrific events. So you can be sure that these will both be can't miss events. So this week's podcast is kind of looking to the future. You know, whatever happens in the election, you're going to have a new Congress and they're going to be inheriting the same set of problems. And so PRI during uh, the fall, we've put out what we've called the Congress to-do lists. And they are our ideas, our recommendations for the next Congress, whoever uh, is in charge, um, for market-based policy ideas for the key challenges facing the country on healthcare, on energy, and on education. They are ideas with really intellectual heft behind them. And there are also ideas that I would argue, you know, have the potential to win bipartisan support. And uh, joining us today is uh, our Dr. Wayne Weingarten, who will talk about a lot of the healthcare and energy recommendations with, we, we really do have serious issues on, on, on energy uh, coming forward, not just affordability, but looking in Europe. Um, Europe may run out of, uh, uh, of uh, sufficient fuel supplies. So Wayne talks about ideas, you know, to not only bring gas prices down, but in 
ensure we have the you know supplies that we need. Yes, and we certainly need new ideas in Congress and in Sacramento. Thank you again for joining us. And here's Wayne Weingarten. Welcome back to PRI's next round, Wayne. Always great to be here. So, Wayne, we're chatting today right before the midterm elections. So whoever wins control of Congress this year will have a a pretty big to-do policy list when they take office in January. So to help them, PRI has put out what we're calling the Congress to-do list. And we're happy to have you on to discuss some of the PRI's policy recommendations for for the next Congress. So let's start with with energy policy. One of the top issues that, that voters have consistently rated as their top priority this election has been to get gas prices down. So while we've seen a little bit of a dip in recent weeks, they still remain pretty high, higher than when President Biden took office two years ago. So what do you recommend that newly elected members of Congress put at the top of their agenda to to jumpstart domestic energy production and to give Americans some relief from these these sky high prices at the pump? The most important, I guess, obstacle uh, to greater production, because we should be producing a lot more oil oil, natural gas, all of these you know, fossil fuels that uh, uh, provide cheap, reliable electricity. Uh, and mind you, natural gas has also helped with the whole uh, greenhouse gas emissions issue. Um, and, and the key is to get more production uh, out there. Um, part of that is uh, with leases, that we need to have more leases. But one of the biggest problems that you have, even if you can get a lease approved on federal lands, is the regulatory burden. Because there, the regulatory burden has become such a morass that you just can't develop, even if you have the rights, it takes too long to develop something, to build the necessary infrastructure, whether that's pipelines or export terminals. So take the, the, the National Environmental Policy Act, or what's called NEPA. That has to be streamlined because right now what ends up happening is it gets abused by environmentalists and becomes an open-ended call for different environmental reviews that the the, the issues have been addressed uh, and yet there's just continued reviews year after year after year and you, you not only do you not have a realistic assessment of the risks, but you just basically shut down the projects in in that red tape. So if you're talking about a an actual specific policy that Congress can implement that would actually help bring down not just gas prices, but also electricity prices, it's revise NEPA so that we have a, a sensible environmental review that addresses the issues that need to be addressed and no more. And it streamlines it so that projects can get done and start producing in a reasonable amount of time. So when we've seen that Europe this winter faces the potential for significant energy shortages, partly caused by the war in Ukraine and Russia cutting off um, supplies from natural gas pipelines. But part of their dilemma has been caused by policy mistakes enacted by politicians. And surprisingly, America might actually face similar challenges if we don't change course. So what policy action items do you recommend that the new Congress take to ensure that the light are on and the heaters are on and energy and natural gas remain affordable. Let's get to you know, what we were just talking about in terms of production, uh, because we need we 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 need b- before you can start about talking about production, we need to have a realistic conversation about global climate change and the right policies. Because right now we're having an unrealistic discussion based on fantasy, uh, not actual kind of technologies that exist. Right now, if we're going to have a a, a, a productive economy that has a secure, stable uh, electricity grid and has the energy we need, we need to use fossil fuels. We need to uh, enhance the fracking revolution uh, that not only has brought down natural gas prices and delivered affordable energy to, um, to Americans, the fracking revolution in natural gas is actually the reason, one of the main reasons, that the total amount of greenhouse gas emissions from the U.S. has been declining since the mid-2000s. So here we have a technology that provides stable, cheap electricity while reducing our greenhouse gas emissions, and yet we're discouraging the production of that, and we're discouraging the use of fracking. And that needs to change. We need to, in practice, get more 
uh, drilling done, more fracking done. And that means reinstating the, the suspended license for, for drilling in, in Anwar, expanding leases for oil and natural gas on federal lands, including uh, drilling on the outer shelf. We, we need to also expand our natural gas export terminals so that not only can the U.S., benefit from natural gas, but this can become an important export, particularly to Europe. And Tim, you were just talking about how Europe is phrasing uh, uh, supplies uh, that are uh, uncertain and, and the lights may not be on this winter. Well, the U.S. has the resources to relay that. Uh, and so we need to build more natural gas uh, export terminals. All of this type of investment in infrastructure uh, is incredibly important to address the high prices that we're seeing. And then from an innovation perspective, you know, we, we do need to incentivize. Uh, I would prefer using uh, tax incentives uh, so that we're not actually favoring one technology over another, but we do want to incentivize continued innovation. But in the here and now, energy security relies on fossil fuels. So Wayne, the, the Biden administration, the state of California, and many countries around the world have set arbitrary timetables for transitioning to having electricity produced by 100% renewable resources. But one clean energy source that's been politically controversial in the U.S. is, is nuclear power. So what steps do you recommend Congress to take to encourage the, the increased production of a safe power source that's perhaps pretty clean and, and widely available? I, I love the term politically controversial because I think that's that's exactly what it is. We have a vision of nuclear power where the risks are not, uh, the, the actual risks are not commensurate with the politically viewed risks. And we essentially, we view nuclear waste and nuclear kind of the pecuniary risks to be many fold higher than what the actual risks are. And so we have a regulatory environment that is, is, is regulated to the imaginary politicized risks, not to the actual risks. And so what that does is it decreases nuclear's cost competitiveness. And then, you know, as, as we've been talking, it, it makes it uh, incredibly difficult to construct a new plant because the, the time it takes to get through all of the, the regulatory hurdles is just too long. I mean, in, in the case of nuclear, you can be even talking about decades. I mean, just, uh, just nonsensical timelines in terms of getting a, a power source online. So we need to streamline those regulations and we need to allow nuclear power to compete without this kind of, you know, uh, burden, uh, unnecessary burden on it. I mean, in, in, in my view, I believe it will have an important role to play, but that's, you know, without the, the regulatory costs, we can let that play out and see if in fact people invest in it and that we, it, it does become a, a, an important source. Like I said, my view is that if you look at the, the technical specifications, the costs, the fact that it can produce zero emission electricity for decades and decades and decades, that there's an incredible amount of value that nuclear can provide. Uh, and so we need to deregulate. Uh, and, and that needs to be a priority for Congress uh, in, in order to allow that uh, potential to, to arise. So we've also seen through this so-called Inflation Reduction Act and other measures that um, Congress continues to spend billions on electric car subsidies that primarily benefit the wealthy. So what steps do you recommend Congress take in the area of electric cars and electric car subsidies? You know, what, if anything, should policymakers be doing in this area of fuel efficiency and, and promoting electric vehicles? It's funny because a, a common theme is, is is developing here. I feel a little bit like, uh, you know, President Reagan, you know, the, the, the most horrifying uh, words in the English language are, uh, you know, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. Um, and that's, in, in a sense, what's been happening across all of these areas. And, and it's the same thing with electric vehicles. We have an unrealistic view of what EVs are, what they can do, and we're heavily subsidizing them in order to force people to uh, purchase a product that without the subsidies, um, they wouldn't purchase. And, and the irony is that you hear in terms of the just uh, justification for electric vehicles is, oh, that they're they're ready for prime time, that they're, people would want them, they're competitive products, they're price competitive. Actually, over the lifetime, you even hear people say that electric vehicles are cheaper to own and operate. And of course, if that were the case, then you wouldn't need to subsidize them. So the fact that they are pushing for subsidies demonstrates that electric vehicles are not as good as vehicles based on the internal 
combustion engine. They are inferior products uh, that are, are just not ready for prime time. Maybe one day they will be, uh, but they're not. And the more money we spend on it, we're actually having government spending that's a value destructive. We're taking resources that are higher value use uh, in the private sector, and we're using it to uh, funnel through government to purchase a product that is less valuable, that's value destructive, that's harmful to growth. Uh, and so we should be getting rid of all of these subsidies. And we haven't even, by the way, touched upon the fact that EVs may not even uh, lower emissions when you look into the lifetime uh, emissions of the product. Uh, they don't talk, we haven't talked about the minerals and the mining uh, that relies on slave labor and child labor and it doesn't tremendous amount of environmental damage. We haven't talked about the slave labor and the Uyghurs that go into the construction of the actual batteries, which, and all of this is pollutive as well. You know, not even talking about all of those costs. Uh, it, it, you know, there's, there's a lot of reason to be skeptical. So ideally, the government's going to get its hands off of this scale completely. I don't think that if we, what we're talking about here is a, uh, a to-do list for Congress. And I'm not sure eliminating EV subsidies is politically possible. Uh, and so uh, I, I think an important compromise permission, uh, position is just to limit the income threshold for those subsidies. Our research has shown that you're talking about 80% of the subsidies goes to the wealthiest households. Uh, and so if you limit it to $75,000 a year, for instance, what you're going to then do is at least remove the regressive nature of the current subsidies right now. Because right now, those subsidies, I talked about why they're they're bad economics, but the, the subsidies right now go to the wealthiest. So it's, it's, it's regressive. Everybody pays taxes, but the wealthiest are the ones who get the EV subsidies. If we put a, a income limit, you at least cap that regressive nature. And so that's in a kind of an achievable um, congressional to-do list item, uh, capping that income uh, or capping the EV subsidies uh, is an important thing to, uh, to get done. So Wayne, many of these, these policy proposals will require long-term thinking and will take some time to implement before, before we realize the benefits from these market-based ideas. So with the U.S. and the world facing real-time energy challenges this winter, what reforms would you encourage Congress to adopt fairly quickly that would help uh, realize uh, the most immediate benefits? Well, markets are forward-looking, so I, I, I do think there would be immediate benefits if we did some credible deregulatory efforts uh, that would encourage greater production. We would know that uh, production markets with no production will be coming on, and so uh, knowing that that would be there in the future, that would have some uh, immediate uh, benefits. But you know, having said that, you know things do take time, and there's you know a lot of vol- volatility out there, and a lot of difficulties have already been baked into the cake. Um, and you know, the best way to deal with that, though, is by the credible reforms to create that long-term certainty for investments in infrastructure and drilling and, and those issues. Uh, something you can do um, immediately that would help uh, certain segments, and, and we were talking about this earlier, uh, if you talk, talk about the Jones Act, which might seem uh, kind of completely distant from what we're talking about here, but the Jones Act requires that uh, if you're going from a U.S. port to a U.S. port, it needs to be a U.S. ship with U.S. crew, yada, yada, yada. Well, that makes it nearly impossible to ship natural gas uh, to the Northeast uh, in the U.S. And the Northeast is facing uh, a, a cold winter. It's <laughs> Geographically, it gets cold up in Boston. Uh, we, they haven't built the pipelines. And so they're going to very possibly be shortages of natural gas if we would uh, repeal or at least uh, have a temporary repeal of the Jones Act, uh, we could actually deliver natural gas uh, that would help with the pricing pressures uh, and certainly uh, help with the shortages. So there are some sensible uh, changes that we could do that would have some um, effects in specific areas. And we should definitely pursue all of those uh, to, to uh, you know help alleviate the costs. Uh, but like I said, the, the, the rest of it, there's, there, there's some long-term um, stability that's required before we're going to get to the full benefits. So in addition to our Congress to-do list, 
PRI has also put together a California to-do list of reforms that state lawmakers should consider in a, in a host of policy areas. Now, you've written extensively about energy policy in California over the years. So what one or two policy reforms do you think should be a priority for newly elected state lawmakers to increase energy affordability and reliability in the state? You know, California does so much wrong in energy. It's, it's actually hard to choose. Um, I guess I would say number one is eliminate the mandate that uh, all cars by 2035 or whenever it is must be an electric vehicle if it's sold in California. Uh, and, and I think the reason I'm, I'm picking on that one is because it, 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 of all the unrealistic policies that uh, California has implemented, and there are many of them, this is possibly the most uh, unrealistic, completely based on wishful thinking, that masquerades as policy. Uh, and as we get closer, the impacts are going to really, you know, start to start to mount. Uh, and on top of it, as people try to comply with it and people buy more electric vehicles, that's going to also start to uh, interact with many of the other poor policy choices we've made. And the it'll really destabilize our electricity grid. So I, I think from a symbolic perspective, as well as from a um, in a practical perspective, getting rid of that uh, EV mandate uh, could be uh, very important. Uh, it's also though important, you know, I guess number two, you, you said I can have two, I'll sneak in three, but the, the cap and trade and renewable energy mandates, uh, they're driving up the cost of electricity for no gain in uh, greenhouse gas reductions. Um, not just from a global perspective, something, you know, I was reading the other day talking about the uh, wildfires and I think it said the wildfires over the past uh, years uh, has released as much emissions into the atmosphere as 10 years um, worth of production, something to, to that effect. But basically what it's demonstrating is that the wildfires have completely counteracted any of the supposed reduction in greenhouse gas emissions that have been achieved from these policies. Now, where the irony comes in is that to some extent, and it's not all the wildfires, it may not even be a majority of them, but some of them were due to um, the the electricity infrastructure not being maintained that started the fires. Well, the lack of maintenance on wires and other types of infrastructure occurred because of the energy mandates. You can't, you know, it, resources are not infinite. And so if you're going to force a company to spend money on X, they're not going to have money for Y. In this case, X were renewable energy mandates and Y was maintenance of the infrastructure and keeping the lines clean, the things of that nature. So there's been a, a real cost in terms of emissions, let alone all the other destruction from the fires, but in terms of emissions from the programs that were supposed to reduce emissions. And so I think that, you know, you, you take that together and it's, you, it, it makes no sense to continue to push down these, these energy mandates and the cap and trade policies that are not only imposing huge costs on Californians um, and not only harming our economy, um, but it's in fact not, not, not only is it not reducing emissions, it's increasing emissions. So let's talk about healthcare. PRI also put out a, a healthcare policy reform list that Congress should consider to to improve affordability and accessibility and, and quality for all. So one of the areas that you have focused on in your work is is healthcare innovation. What are some of the policy changes that you would encourage Congress to put at the top of their agenda to remove some of the politician-created roadblocks that are standing in the way of healthcare innovation being realized and helping America's patients? I think there's a lot of low-hanging fruit in this area. I mean, the, the, there's a lot of benefits to broader um, reform to health insurance and all, all of those types of issues. That is kind of long-term uh, complicated healthcare reform, but there's all sorts of restrictions on practitioners, whether it's doctors, nurse, nurse practitioners, physicians, assistants, e even pharmacists. And those types of employment restrictions, which is essentially what they are, um, restrict providers from being able to, to, to care to, for patients to the extent of their training. Uh, and that reduces, not only does it kind of reduce choice by consumers. But when you force a doctor to do something that a, a PA could do, then you're, you're increasing inflating costs as well. So allowing kind of that type of reform to occur in kind of that scope of practice 
uh, is particularly important. It could give greater uh, flexibility to how healthcare is delivered, and that kind of supply side uh, reforms can actually help um, increase the quality of care while also bringing down uh, the costs. Uh, and so you can also do other types of um, reforms that ensure telemedicine will continue to flourish. Again, innovation in not just who is delivering it, but how it's delivered. And that could be an important kind of one-two kind of reform that, again, these, this is low-hanging fruit. It's not going to um, kind of fix the system, but it will make noticeable improvements in terms of the quality of care and in terms of the cost of care. So one of the big so-called accomplishments, really, cited by the president and Democrats in Congress are the prescription drug provisions in this so-called Inflation Reduction Act. Now, you've analyzed the negative impact these policy changes could have on the accessibility and affordability of life-saving treatments. So in light of this, what policy changes would you advise the new Congress take to help continue realizing healthcare innovation and lowering drug costs for, for patients, while also blunting the impact of this misguided new law? Well, the first thing we should do is just uh, is repeal the law. I mean, the, the, the law is, there, there are some positive aspects to it, but the vast majority of it is very detrimental and should just be, just would be repealed, start over. Uh, if we want to deal with drug pricing, the, the, first, the first priority has to be transparency. There are so many different types of prices when you're talking about drugs that people quite don't understand, and nor, nor should they, kind of what, what the actual costs are, how those are being um, kind of working its way through the system, who is benefiting from it. I mean, there's all sorts of complexities that really have um, made the, the drug markets inefficient. And in the opacity of those markets, it's allowing um, a lot of cronyism to develop. And that cronyism is, in effect, uh, extracting a pound of flesh out of the drug pricing system to the detriment of patients. And so we need that fundamental reform to the way that drug pricing works. And that also then very much interacts with the way drug health insurance is going to work. Right now, the way insurance works, we use insurance to purchase generic drugs. Well, the vast majority of generic drugs currently sell for around $20 they're 90% of the all drugs sold. I think it's 95% of them sell for 20 or less. And we're actually seeing innovations by Amazon, CVS, and Walmart that can bring these costs down to $5. These, these are not insurable transactions. But what happens is by uh, com combining this into our insurance system, you, we're wasting resources on what is a non-insurable event. We're taking away the incentive for patients to look for those best deals. Uh, and we're also taking away the incentive uh, for more uh, companies to come in and provide those deals to really make those work. But on the flip side, we spend so much resources on, on issues that are not insurable transactions that when you actually do have something that's insurable, you have, God forbid, cancer that has you know, tens of thousands of dollars of drug costs, your, your insurance benefits cop out. So the insurance system is failing us at the exact moment when we need it. So we need to reform the way the drug whole system works so that it's transparent, so that consumers can drive the market for the 90% of medicines that are generics and affordable, that will keep those costs down. And then the insurance just focuses on ensuring or capping exposure when the risk of requiring an expensive medicine comes to fruition for those patients uh, where it happens. That's the best way to address the drug pricing. It's complicated. It certainly doesn't fit on a bumper sticker, but it, it is the way to address the problem rather than price controls, which is what the Inflation Reduction Act uh, tried to do. Um, and that that's going to just uh, harm innovation and not really address the root causes of the problem. So before we close, you have a new study that will be coming out soon, focusing on the problems with so-called 340B hospitals and recommending reforms to ensure that this program designed to help our 
our poorest patients fulfill its mission instead of fattening the pockets of hospitals that the way they're doing now. So share with our listeners a preview of your study and also some of the reforms, reform ideas that you would encourage state and federal policymakers to, to consider in this area. Oh, absolutely. I mean, 340B, it's funny, that's, it's such a nondescript name, right? 340B, I mean, it just, but it actually has become the second largest drug discount program in the country. I mean, so it, it, it was a program that was supposed to target specific in, you know, healthcare um, hospitals and healthcare facilities that serve a uh, disproportionately serve low-income patients or patients who are lacking insurance. And the idea was supposed to help them be able to purchase their drugs on the cheap so that they could, in effect, turn around and expand care uh, to those vulnerable populations. Well, what's happened over time, and I'm not going to get into the, the, the details because it, it gets it gets into the weeds very quickly, but the program has both exploded in growth, but it's also the institutions that are qualifying for the program has expanded. Now, the, vat, the majority of hospitals now are actually 340B hospitals. Mind you, and this is another work that we've done, the 340B hospitals don't actually provide more charity care than non 340B hospitals. So you have a system where we're trying to support hospitals that serve lower income people, but they actually don't provide more charity care. So the, the, the program has just gotten off track. The um, the actual um, oversight of the program is lacking. There have been a lot of studies by uh, the Government Accountability Office uh, that's demonstrated that there's just a, a absolutely poor oversight. Uh, abuse is rampant. Uh, contract pharmacies have gotten involved. And now you have about $2.9 billion from the program of being siphoned off to uh, subsidize uh, specialty pharmacies, Walgreens, CVS, Rite Aid, uh, it, it, it not fulfilling its actual mission. So what we need to do in terms of reforming it, uh, again, I mean, my, my preference would be to reform the entire healthcare system so that such a program isn't necessary. But if we're talking about something that's achievable in, in the near term, what we need to do is bring the program back down to its original intentions. And so what that means is we need to one, have greater stringency requirements for, for qualifying for the program. We need to actually limit the number of pharmacies that can uh, operate within, uh, uh, operate as part of the team with a, a hospital. Uh, I mean, we have some instances now where some hospitals have over 200 contract pharmacies working with them. Some of them are clear across the country. A total sign of abuse. Um, and we also, in, and out as it sounds, there's no requirements that patients benefit from the program. So you have a situation where an uninsured patient is at a facility that's a 340B facility. The facility buys the medicine at 50% off, but the patient's costs are based on the full price of the medicine. That that type of uh, uh, lack of benefit or, or or lack of capping of, of the cost for patients is, is really in, uh, in, inappropriate, and so we should be capping their costs so that so they're directly benefiting as well. If if we do that, we can bring the program back down to a size where its flaws aren't causing all of this costs on the healthcare system. Um, and, and, and all of this abuse, uh, you know, that, that they would exist. It's just you're not accentuating it. As a program has grown, we've really seen um, all sorts of, uh, of, of those adverse impacts arise. And we could spend a whole podcast talking about it, but that's, I think, just the, the, the basis of the program that we're talking about, that a program that was intended to help institutions that help uh, at-risk populations has grown well beyond that, is causing uh, problems throughout the healthcare system and needs to be rolled back. Thanks so much, Wayne. Thank you. If you like this episode, please tell your friends and subscribe to PRI's podcast at iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeartRadio, and Spotify. And when you're on these platforms, don't forget to give us a big five stars. If you don't subscribe to any of these, you can still listen on PRI's YouTube page, youtube.com slash Pacific Research One. That's the number one. Thanks for listening. I'm Rowena Ichon. Hope you'll come back again for next round with PRI.